As the Grips War raged on, the Titans began fielding more and more powerful mobile weapons in an attempt to completely stomp out the Ayug rebels and later on Axis Zeon. But there were two big problems with these new machines. They were expensive and difficult to pilot, often to the point that they could only be used by top aces or cyber new types. This made them unfit for mass production and would result in many of the Titans' pilots still using the Hyzak or the similarly obsolete Jim 2 until late in the war. And to remedy the situation, the Titans went back to the basics, a mass production mobile suit based on a Gundam. This time, the Gundam Mark II. And the result of this was the very unique looking Barzam. But saying that the Barzam was just a mass production version of the Gundam Mark II would be a gross simplification of just how much R&D went into this single machine. Just like saying that today's sponsor is just a mobile game would also be a gross simplification. Raid Shadow Legends, a game with a super detailed and tactical RPG battle system, incredible graphics, an intense combination of PvE and PvP combat, and over 700 unique champions to collect and play with. And personally, I'm really digging the aesthetic of the Banner Lords and the Sacred Order. So here's my top 3 knightly champions that I'm hoping to add to my team. Raglan with her awesome golden armor and purple cloak, Roshkart the tower with his amazing V-fin, and Martyr because I've noticed that my crusader sometimes dies a bit too quickly. And if all of this sounds right up your fancy alley, then I've got more good news because for new players, Raid has a special AR egg hunt for dragon eggs. And inside of these eggs can be anything from legendary champions to help you kill a dragon to Amazon gift cards with a total value of 20,000 US dollars. All you have to do to join is download Raid using my link down below or the QR code on screen, copy your in-game player ID, head on over to egghunt.polarium.com and start scouring the Dragon Slayer. And already existing players can also go to the Egg Hunt website where they'll get a special code that will give them a cool gift. And last but not least, by signing up to Raid with that link down below, you'll get a free starter pack with all of this amazing in-game loot. For the full story of the Barzam then, we have to go all the way back to the Gundam TR-1 Hazel, a souped up Jim Quell that had become more Gundam than Jim thanks to its plethora of high performance test parts. This machine, alongside others, was assigned to the Titans test team and its data along with that of the other machines, was used to develop the Gundam Mark II. But while the Gundam Mark II was being developed, the Hazels were continuously being outfitted with different and new kinds of prototype parts, creating a very branched development tree. But the one that is relevant to our story today is the one that created the Hazel Osla. Starting out as a standard Jim Quell, this machine was originally only meant to serve as spare parts for the original Hazel, but as the situation changed, it would be pushed into service and redesignated as the Hazel 2. Its next round of upgrades then would introduce various features and design elements that would be carried over to the Barzam. These being a new mono eye sensor for sniping, the bulky legs and the high heeled feet. And after this, this now advanced Hazel would be further upgraded into the Hazel Osla by equipping it with the Primrose. And while this more well-armed configuration might not really resemble the Barzam all that much, one of its configurations was kept as basic as possible. The Hazel Osla Next Generation Mass Production Type. And here we can really see the unique form of the Barzam beginning to take form. But this would be far from the only machine used to develop the Barzam. For its mainframe, it used the drum frame first used by the Kahar and further refined by the TR-6 Woundwort. Something that would lead to the machine looking very distinct from other Federation mobile suits 
and even the main machine that it was supposedly based on, the aforementioned Gundam Mark II. And this was especially pronounced in the resulting hip structure. But for Unique Chest, we have to look at the combined armor that was tested out on the Rosette Enhanced Land Combat form, which itself was a development of the Heizak Cannon's optional chest armor. The legs and head then, as mentioned before, were mostly influenced by the upgrade parts for the Hazels, but also incorporated data from the Heizak Vanergant. Next up then, we have the arms and the purpose-built beam rifle that were inspired by the Primrose. And this beam rifle had some very unique features about it. Not only was it held on the outside of the arm to allow it to be connected to the shoulder armor, but unlike many other weapons used during the Grips War, it didn't use a replaceable E-Pack. It could also be used as a shield and a grenade launcher could be mounted on the outside. And talking about the Primrose, depending on the version of the Barzam, it also came with an emergency escape system. There is no mention of this on the original Barzam, but in the advance of Zeta Barzam, a modified version of the Woundwarts Primrose 2 is installed in the torso via the drum frame. Something that is also given as an explanation for the Barzam's unique torso design. All of these different technologies then were brought together at the New Guinea base and simplified to create the Barzam, the mass production version of the Gundam Mark II. Kinda. But the high grade model kit of the Barzam does give you the option of swapping out its backpack with that of the Gundam Mark II, making the two slightly more related. Also, despite being a mass production machine for the Titans, the design was finalized by mostly ex Xeon staff. Continuing with its weapons then, it had two beam sabers, one in each arm, and an optional double Vulcan pod inspired by that of the Gundam Mark II. And in some manga, the Barzam can also be seen using standard Federation handheld weaponry like the BR-87A beam rifle and the Mark II's shield. And there was even one occasion of a Hyzak using the Barzam's dedicated beam rifle. Unfortunately for the Barzam though, it never truly got its chance to shine. At least not with the Titans. Because despite them being able to churn out these machines at a surprising rate, the writing was already on the wall. The Titans were losing, and despite being arguably the best mass production machine of the war, the Barzam simply wasn't enough to turn the tide. What also didn't help is that they no longer had the backing of the Federation, meaning that they couldn't produce enough Barzams to replace all of their older machines. But despite being in service for only a short period of time, the Barzam did have a few variants, including a pre-production version that was supplied to a top secret special unit within the Titans, the Black Hairs. At first glance, the only real differences with the finalized Barzams are that its arms and weapons are taken from the Gundam Mark II. But when you look closer, you'll see that everything else is also slightly different. The legs and chest are a different shape, the head has a reinforced visor, and the backpack resembles an early version of what would later on be used by the Jagan and these units would be extensively used in the fight against the Ayug. However, the most famous variant is without a doubt the refined Barzam, an overhauled and upgraded version of the standard Barzam that also fell much more in line with the Gundam Mark II that it was supposedly based on. The head remained largely the same, but the legs were completely redesigned to be sleeker, it had a more conventional looking torso behind the combined armor, skirt armor modeled after that of the Mark II, and the arms and backpack were now virtually identical to those of the Mark II. And the same went for the weapons. The Vulcan pot remained mostly the same, but the two beam sabers were now stored on the backpack, and instead of the unique shield and beam rifle combo thing, it now used the Mark II shield, hyper bazooka and beam rifle, but now with an optional underslung grenade launcher. 
And while this was everything that we got for the refined Barzan in the story, we did get some interesting ideas that could have been had the Titans beaten the Ayug and gained access to the Ayug's upgrades for the Gundam Mark II. And one of these upgrades was the full armor Gundam Mark II. And the robot spirits figure of the refined Barzam is completely compatible with the full armor parts, allowing you to create the full armor Barzam. This version comes with extra armor, extra thrusters, and of course, extra weapons. A twin grenade launcher for the left arm and a twin beam cannon for the right arm, which also has a built-in grenade launcher. Unfortunately, the G Defensor was in development at the same time, and it was seen as an overall better solution for the same problem, resulting in the full armor add-on parts not being used by the Mark II, nor by the refined Barzan. And talking about the G Defensor, this thing connects to the backpack of the Gundam Mark II to form the Super Gundam. And because the refined Barzan's backpack is virtually identical to that of the Mark II, it stands to reason that it can also dock with the G Defensor. An idea that was used for the Armor Girls Project Gundam Mark II figure. This set didn't just come with the G Defensor, but also with parts to turn her into the refined Barzan. So you could also turn her into the super refined Barzan. And just like the full armor version, this granted the machine extra protection, extra thrusters, and extra weapons. Two 14 tube missile launchers and a long rifle that was comparable to the Hyakushiki's Mega Bazooka launcher in terms of power. And as mentioned before, the high grade of the regular version does come with the ability to swap out its backpack for that of the Mark II, meaning that you can also make your own regular Super Barzan. But with the war coming to an end, many Titans pilots, together with their Barzams, would either surrender to the Federation, or throw in their lot with one of the various Zeon Remnant groups. And this would lead to two very different fates for these Barzams. The Federation wanted to distance themselves as far from the Titans as they could, even going as far as to mothball the excellent Alexandria-class cruiser. But attempts were also made at untitanifying certain mobile suits. A prime example of this was the Byerland, which was turned into two Byerland customs under the Chimera project. And the same also happened with the Barzam. With their own forces in shambles and the rapidly advancing Axis forces, they couldn't really ignore the high-performance Barzam. And thanks to its highly modular frame, courtesy of the Wound Ward, it was also very easy to modify with technology from the prominent Ayuk and Earth Federation mobile suits, turning it into a much more gym-like machine. And these conversions were a joint venture undertaken by Buch Aerodynamics and NAMSD Labs. In March of UC0088, this so-called bar gym was only adopted by the Ayugan Karaba as the MS-008, but after seeing its performance, the Earth Federation would also adopt the machine with the model number RGM-87. And around this time, two types existed. The A-type, which only had its head modified, and the B-type, which used parts from the Gym 3 to increase parts compatibility and also ease of maintenance. This work on the Barzan would prove invaluable for both companies involved who would continue their mobile suit development plans. Labs was able to acquire more researchers who had previously also worked on the TR series, and Buch Aerodynamics launched a collaboration with Sinri, a series of events that would result in the Bargem C-type, which would then later on be upgraded into the C2-type by switching out its generator with that of a Jagan J-type. And it seems that these conversions were a huge success. In the UC-120s, they would be deployed by several colonies to defend themselves against the Oldsmobile army, and they were still in use by the Side 2 Alliance well into the UC-140s. But the honor of the longest-serving confirmed Barzam goes to a unit known as the Vakezam. 
Although, to be honest, calling this thing a Barzam is generous at best. While it does have the head of a Barzam, it's got the body of a Methus, arms of a Zaku 2, a Marasai shield, and no legs. But those are just for show anyways. What it does have are various cosmetic touches like the cloak and the nails to make this thing look more terrifying and to give it the vibe of a zombie or a ghost. Unfortunately, these did little for the weak performance of this machine. So let's quickly move back to our more successful bar gyms because one customized version is also known to have existed. The Bar Gym Mahouse which was deployed by the private military company Burnham. Similarly to the Jagan Burnham custom, it was painted in purple and had a sensor over the left eye. The other changes are unknown, but it's said that its performance was equal or even superior to that of the early Jagans. And in UC-116, it would be further customized with a beam lance. Many other Barzams then would end up fighting against the Federation as part of Rezion. These units were redesignated as ARZ-154 and would see a number of minor modifications. The most striking one is their new color scheme, but the crotch was also changed, the leg thrusters were slightly different, and a leg-mounted hovering system now became part of the Barzam standard equipment but many of these units would also be further modified with parts from the TR series. These modifications had actually also been planned by the Titans as part of the Barzam's modular design, but due to the state they were in by the time of the unit's deployment, simply mass producing the thing probably took priority. Also, whereas the Barzam was a mere mass production unit for the Titans, for Rezion, it would become something much more. For them, the Gundam TR-6 wound ward had led them to victory in the civil war against Mars Zeon. So, as the development from the wound ward, the Barzan was treated as an ace unit and even became a royal guard unit. But then again, like I just said, the Barzans deployed by Rezion weren't just Barzams. One of the most out there modifications was the Grand Barzam. This form was achieved by equipping the Barzam with the massive Grand Hovering Unit. Or for marine operations, the Barzam could be outfitted with the Aqua Humbrabi 2, turning it into the Aqua Barzam, also nicknamed Trident due to the trident-like shape that the head and the shoulders had in this configuration. Most of the equipment consisted of parts that could be hooked up to the Barzam on a moment's notice, but with enough preparation time, the Barzam could also be equipped with a specialized visor, the cockpit could be strengthened to better resist the water pressure, and the joints could also be sealed. Its main weapon then was the Bahal rifle, an underwater version of the Phaedine rifle that also had four harpoons around the barrel. Now, this equipment was completed right before the end of the Griff's War, so while images of the Titans version exist, it's not known if they ever got to use them in real combat before fleeing to Rezion. Also, despite being called an Aqua unit, by adding the extra boosters and weapons of the Humbrabi 2 to the Barzam, or whatever other unit it was equipped to, the machine's performance would be increased no matter what the battlefield was. And finally for Rezion, they would also use a successor unit of the Barzam, the Barzam 2. Although, this does come with somewhat of an asterisk, because this version was actually first conceived by the Titans during the Grips War as an alternative mass production version for the Jim, the Hazel Ozla, and the Barzam. Rather than trying to simplify and mash together a bunch of different machines, the Titan specification of the Barzam 2 was basically just the body of the wound wart with the limbs of the Hazel Ozla, a new head, and some minor modifications. Rezion would run with this idea 
and recreated but with bars and limbs instead of OZA limbs and a new antenna that was connected to their satellite surveillance system. This satellite system allowed them to receive common information on the fly and it also opened up when communicating, giving it a more Gundam-like appearance. Something that is said to have had a great psychological effect on both friend and foe alike. And just like the regular Barzam, this Barzam 2 could also be outfitted with the Grand Unit, becoming the Grand Barzam 2. It could probably also use the Aquahumbrabi, but no images or records exist of that yet. So instead, let's talk about the two remaining Barzam variants. First up, the Barzam Commander Custom. And unlike what you might be expecting based on the name, this wasn't just a commander version of the Barzam with an extra antenna. Instead, this machine was one of the prototypes made to test out experimental parts that could potentially be used with the finalized Barzam. It was outfitted with high performance thrusters on the backpack and hovering units on the shoulders and legs, allowing it to hover under gravity as well as giving it superior maneuverability. Its standard weapons then were a Vulcan pod, a rapid fire linear railgun modified from those meant for the Garuda, and a crotch mounted mega particle gun with an output rated of 5.4 megawatts. And what's interesting about this crotch mega particle cannon is that for a long time there was a lot of speculation going on about what that thing on the regular Barzam's crotch was. In fact, not even the animators were sure what to do with the thing, because it can be seen drawn in the corner, which would eventually be confirmed as correct, and in the middle, which is probably the most aesthetically pleasing of the two. As for what it was, the two leading theories were that it was either a mega particle cannon, which is what this variant went with, or some kind of refueling port which is what it actually turned out to be. But back to the Commander Custom. For defense, it uses a shield that could also be used as the back skirt, and just like any real Commander unit, it also had a more powerful antenna, and was said to be 11% more powerful than the regular Barzam. And the pilot of this customized prototype was Colonel Russ Hannibal, the commander of the 13th Autonomous Mobile Squadron, Dragoon 13, stationed on board the Garda class Harvey. They were an Earth Federation unit consisting entirely of ex Xeon soldiers and were tasked with patrolling the Kilimanjaro area. And finally, we have the Musica, a brand new Barzan variation that recently appeared in the UC Engage smartphone game. The Ashimar was a highly successful transformable unit during the Grips War, but its high performance also came at a high price. So it was decided to incorporate it into the Barzam to lower its cost. And one of the main ways they tried to achieve this was by replacing the Ashimar's drum frame with the Barzam, which resulted in a very unique looking machine which was also outfitted with its own custom beam rifle. And the Oshimar parts could also separate from the Barzam to form the Musica based subflight system. Whether or not this machine was ever built or only exists as a paper design is currently unknown, but what I do know is that if you want to know more about the Oshimar's development history, you can check that out through the link on screen or down below in the description and top comment. And that has been all for the Barzam, one of the more unique looking Federation mobile suits. Especially considering the fact that it's supposed to be the mass production version of the Gundam Mark II, one of the best looking Gundams ever. But fortunately, we did get the refined Barzam. So as always, a big thank you to you Patreon supporters out there. I hope you're all having a great day, and I'll see you all next time.